Good morning. Welcome to all of you on this first Sunday of the year. It's good to see you here. It's good to have some visitors among us. We're glad that you could join us. And if you're watching the recording of this service, welcome to you. We pray that the Lord may bless us all richly today and in the week that is to come. We've entered into the season of Epiphany. In this season in the church calendar, we recognize that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's revealed himself, revealed who God is through himself. And we hear these words from Revelation 21 about Jesus being the light. Not only the light who's come into the world, but the light who will provide his people the light they need for eternity. Revelation 21, verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no more night. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Of course, that's John's picture, the new creation, the temple that Jesus Christ will bring when he returns, and he will fill it with his glorious light. We're here today to celebrate the light who is Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand when we begin singing, or when the music begins, and we'll sing Hosanna, praise is rising. God, who is the light of the world, <clears throat> greets us with these words, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father. 
to whom be the glory with the Son and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. We sing God the Uncreated One. God, the Son who came to take on flesh, mortal flesh, so that he could die in our place, is the one who makes us alive. After we are dead in sin, through faith in Christ, we become new creations. We hear these words as a call to confession, a call to prayer from Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, 
You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Those wonderful words of good news, of gospel truth in our hearts. Let's come to God in a moment of prayer. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, because we are conceived and born sinful, we are born as dead people walking, so to speak. Because of the sin that we inherited from the first Adam, we have no right to call you Father. We have no right to expect to be welcomed into your throne room, and yet that is where we are. We approach you, great God over all creation, great King of creation, as your children, and we can only do that because of Jesus Christ. We can only do that because of the faith that you give us in Jesus. We confess that at one time, even perhaps this past week, even today, this morning, we did walk in the ways of this world. Our ears were attuned to the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the evil spirit who is Satan, who is now at work in those who disobey you and deny you. I pray for all of us here that that is not us, that we are believers in Jesus Christ, that we have faith in Jesus, so that we can truly say that we are, have been made alive with Jesus through faith in him. We do ask for your forgiveness for when we mess up, when we sin against you and your word and your ways, when we give in to the, uh, the cravings of our sinful nature, when we follow our sinful desires and thoughts. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. <clears throat> and Holy Spirit, give us the strength to say no to that which is sinful, to say no to the devil and his tauntings and his temptings, as he lures, uh, tries to lure us into sin, give us the strength to say no and to run from him, to flee from temptation, to run to Jesus Christ, the one who we need, to find rescue and solace in our Lord Jesus and in him alone. Lord Jesus, we need you every moment of our lives, every step of the way, not only for salvation to be granted to us, but so that we can be redeemed and renewed. We need you every moment, every hour. We now sing those words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain seated as we sing, Lord, I need you and I need thee every hour.
continue in Ephesians chapter 2, hearing these words of hope and of assurance that we are in Christ, God's new creations. And God raised us up with Christ, and he has seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And through the power of Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in us, we will accomplish those good works that God has prepared for us to do, works that proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and propel the work of the kingdom. Let's sing of that grace. Let's stand together when the music plays and we sing of grace.
Good morning, boys and girls. Oh, so nice to see you on this snowy morning. Winter's finally arrived, eh? Hey? Are you happy about that? Oh, good. I don't like winter, but I got to put up with it, right? Living here in Canada. God gives us sunny days and snowy days and all our days, right? They all, all our days are a gift from God. We just sung about the grace of God, which is a gift, right? Did you hear what I said from Ephesians? We are saved by grace, not by works, so that no one can boast, right? God's grace to us. Maybe you don't understand what that word is. Grace is a gift you don't deserve, right? So we don't deserve what Jesus did for us. We thank him and we praise him for that, right? And we find out about what Jesus did when we read the Bible. You guys are going to go off to Sunday school and study a Bible story, and we're going to study a part of the Bible where um, it's just at the end of Jesus' childhood. And um, so Matthew writes about that, how he had to move around to stay safe from bad King Herod. We're going to finish that story here. But before you guys go off and before we study the God's Word, we're going to pray, okay? So let's fold our hands, close our eyes, and we'll pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your gift of grace. We thank you for the gift of your word, which tells us all about your love and your grace that we see most clearly in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you came to earth. You took on a human body so that you could die in our place, so that you could save us from our sins. I pray for the children, for all of us, Lord, that whatever age we're at, that our faith would be in Jesus, that our trust would be in him and in him alone. Help us now as we study your word, whether here or in Sunday school, Lord, to be drawn closer to you, to bask and enjoy the love that you have for us that we see in Jesus. And may you be glorified through this study of your word and through our lives that you continue to shape, so that we become more and more like Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, so now you've got to stand up and face the people. It's been a few weeks, but I, you'll probably remember, right? You know what to say? Yeah, maybe. All right, so let's bless the children saying, the Lord be with you. Oh, yeah, you remembered. Okay, you guys can go off to Sunday school. Yay. And for those of us here or watching, I invite you to turn to Matthew's gospel. I didn't hear any yays. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, verse 19, we'll start. You can see in the bulletin, I put down Isaiah 53, the first three verses. We'll hear that in a little bit. We'll see how that ties into this passage. Matthew chapter 2, like I said to the children, this is the end of Matthew's account of Jesus' childhood. If you haven't been with us, if you look back, the Magi had been to visit the newborn Jesus, or the infant, and they had to escape to Egypt. We're going to review that in just a minute. Now we read about the Lord Jesus' return to Nazareth as a child. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea, in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. So just a bit of review as we, before we get into these final verses of chapter 2. Matthew's main objective in these opening chapters is to prove that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah and King. And he shows that Jesus is the Messiah King from both a human perspective and a divine perspective. 
Jesus descends physically from Abraham and David through his mother Mary. And Jesus is divinely conceived and born through God, the Holy Spirit's action. He remains God the Son, even as he takes on full human flesh, a full human body. And so we find that Jesus is the one promised by God, the one sent by God, and the one who is God. Those are Matthew's claims here in chapter 1. And he bases these claims on what the prophets have said, particularly the prophet Isaiah, what he foretold. Matthew says as much in verses 22 and 23 of chapter 1, that all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew is not just pulling these stories or claims about Jesus out of his hat, so to speak. No, he's relying on the Old Testament scriptures to prove that Jesus is God's Messiah King. Then in chapter 2, Matthew goes back to telling the narrative of Jesus' early years. And within that narrative, Matthew again inserts scriptural proof that Jesus is Messiah King. Matthew states four times in chapter 2 that the prophets had foretold who this Messiah would be. And Jesus fits all of the criteria as told by the prophets about the Messiah. And here in chapter 2, we find four prophetic references, and they all have to do with geographic locations. All four places identify Jesus as the one whom God sends to represent Israel, as the true king, the true Messiah, and as Israel itself. So far, we've covered the locations of Bethlehem, Egypt, and Ramah. Jesus is born in Bethlehem, King David's hometown, as David's heir to the throne. Jesus escapes too, and then from Egypt, like Israel did in Moses' time. And Jesus is the answer to the horrors of losing children that Israel faced long ago in Ramah and in our story, as Herod killed all the baby boys. It was hundreds of years earlier that the exile from Israel took place when the mothers lost their children forever into captivity. And here, last week, we read about the slaughter of the baby boys in Bethlehem under the cruel and sadistic Herod. God saved Israel from captivity in Egypt. He saved them to be his set apart, his chosen people, his light to the nations. But the Israelites failed miserably due to their sinful rebellion against God's rule as their king, their true king. Eventually, God sent Israel into exile as punishment, and that exile ended the era of David's kingship, him and his sons. Israel's mothers mourned the loss of their children who they'd never see again. But Jesus' birth as David's son, it renews David's line, it renews the kingship in Israel. So Matthew is telling his readers, there's hope, there's promise, and it's contained in this person named Jesus Christ. His birth, his arrival, announce that there is hope and God's promises will be fulfilled. But as we read, as I just said, the hope and the promise, they are overshadowed by darkness and evil. Satan doesn't just sit back and allow King Jesus to go unchallenged. Satan uses Herod, Herod King Herod in an attempt to destroy Jesus Christ the King. And again, the mother, mothers of Israel's tears, they continue to flow even as Jesus the Messiah comes. They're still exiles under Roman rule. They're suffering under oppression. They're still suffering at the hands of evil kings. Children are still being lost. But look how this sad chapter of the story ends there in verse 19. Herod fails. He dies. God used Joseph to keep Jesus safe in Egypt until Herod dies. Jesus, the newborn king and Messiah, he is spared. God won't let Jesus the true king of Israel, be wiped out by evil. King Jesus is alive, and he will put an end to the weeping and the mourning of God's children. That was true in the Old Testament, New Testament, and it's true today. Matthew is telling his readers then, and God through Matthew today is telling us, keep your eyes on Jesus, the true king. The king has come. He will be victorious. Jesus will succeed where all others have failed. But we can't escape the fact that this path to victory, this journey of renewal, is one of suffering and one of pain. 
Oh, Jesus, he will achieve victory over the enemy of God's people. That enemy is Satan, sin, and death. But the victory that Jesus wins will only come through intense sacrifice. The great Messiah King must be the suffering servant. And that leads us to the fourth locale, the fourth location that Matthew highlights here in chapter 2. And that fourth Old Testament prophetic geographic reference takes us to the town of Nazareth. We read in verses 19 and 20 that God again speaks to Joseph in a dream. This is the third divinely induced dream for Joseph. The fourth dream will come in a few verses, verse 22. Why dreams and not angelic visitations like with the shepherds and with Mary? Why? We don't know. Clearly, God picked dreams as the best way to communicate with Joseph. We don't want to put too much stock in dreams, especially not our own. God can speak through dreams, but very few dreams that we have are about God communicating to us, and so we need to be careful about that. This isn't telling us that every dream is from God. God communicates to us in a different way. He communicates primarily and officially through His Word, the written Word that we have here, but also the living Word who is Jesus Christ. God tells Joseph to take Jesus back to the land of Israel. That exodus from Egypt and the return from exile, they are symbolized in this move. By that I mean the exodus from Egypt and the return from exile of the Israelites. Jesus is reliving their history, so to speak. Now maybe Joseph had in mind of going back to Bethlehem or Jerusalem. Those were locations that were uh, connected to the kings, especially King David. So it would make sense then for King Jesus to grow up in either of those towns, those cities. But in the fourth dream, God warns Joseph that Herod's son now rules Judea. And history tells us that Archelaus is just as murderous, just as sadistic as his father. So Joseph ends up in Galilee, in a town called Nazareth. And Matthew says, So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, He, that is Jesus, will be called a Nazarene. Why was Jesus called a Nazarene? Well, the most simple reason is that he grows up in Nazareth. And to distinguish him from other people with the name Jesus, which was fairly popular, that qualifier, the Nazarene, gets added to his name. Being identified by your place of residence, that was common practice in that day. Another reason that people suggest Jesus was called a Nazarene is because they say he was like a Nazarite. Nazarites took vows of complete dedication to God. They avoided alcohol, cutting their hair, touching dead things. Samson was a Nazarite and likely John the Baptist as well. Now Jesus was completely dedicated to God and to God's plan of salvation. But Jesus was not a Nazarite. He did drink wine, the Bible tells us. He did touch dead people. He did that when he raised them up. We need to focus on what Matthew is saying here. Matthew says many prophets foretold that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. And yet when we search the Old Testament, not one prophet ever said those exact words, he will be called a Nazarene. So how does Matthew get away with saying the prophet said something when there's really no um, word for word evidence of them saying it? Well, because Matthew refers to many prophets here, not just one specific prophet, it's believed that he's referring to an idea, a belief that many prophets shared. The fact that Jesus is from Nazareth fulfills the prophet's picture of who the Messiah, the coming Messiah, would be. And Isaiah is one prophet who reveals these, this prophetic picture of the coming Messiah. In Isaiah 11, verse 1, we read, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The word for branch in Hebrew is netzer. Isaiah is prophesying about the netzer of Jesse, who is of Jesse's son, of course, David. The branch of David is Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 60, verse 21, God promises to save a remnant of the people of Israel through this branch, through this netzer. And the remnant is called a nezer, or root. So this idea of a branch or a shoot Who'd save God's people is found in Isaiah, but it's also found in Zechariah and Jeremiah. 
And so the prophets did foretell the long-awaited branch who would come and revive new life into God's remnant people. This branch, this shoot of new life, would be the Messiah King. Matthew declares that the prophet spoke of Jesus, who would be called a Nazarene. In English, we make it Nazarene. It's the same word. But there's another very important Old Testament prophetic connection between the Messiah branch and the town of Nazareth. And this has to do with a key characteristic of the town of Nazareth. And that characteristic is its reputation. Nazareth was nowheresville compared to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. The town of Nazareth and being a Nazarene was equated with low class, low status, being unimportant. Nazarenes were treated as second class Israelites. And so coming from Nazareth makes Jesus a despised person, a looked down upon person. After hearing that the Messiah had been found, one of his would-be disciples said, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? That was the idea that people had of people from Nazareth. You can read that in John 1 verse 46. As I said, Nazarenes were despised and rejected. They certainly weren't kingly material. In Acts 24, verse 6, the followers of Jesus, they are ridiculed as being from the Nazarene sect. Christians were seen as an offshoot of Judaism. Basically, they were being referred to as the nobody club. And that's exactly how prophets like Daniel and the writer of Psalm 22 and Isaiah described the Messiah. He was a nobody in people's eyes. He was one of low repute. He was scorned. He was derided. The prophets speak about the Messiah being ridiculed, despised, and rejected. And we hear that in Isaiah 53. Here are the first three verses. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Strong words about this Messiah. Harsh words that the prophet Isaiah foretold. People would think about Jesus Christ. And so all through the four Gospels and through the Acts, Jesus is referred to as Jesus of Nazareth. Well, for one thing that meant Jesus was easily identifiable, and verifiable. There probably weren't too many people named Jesus coming from the little town of Nazareth. Connecting Jesus to his hometown so many times in the New Testament, it leaves no doubt that Jesus was a real person from a real place. <clears throat> but most importantly, <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah having a lowly birth, a humble life, and most importantly, a shameful death. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, they nailed a sign above his head. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That sign was meant as a mockery, not as a badge of honor or esteem. In effect, Rome's boast, Rome's message was, here hangs the crucified King of the Jews, a nobody from Nazareth. Why did Jesus have to come from Nazareth? Why was he scorned and ridiculed and mocked as a nobody? Why? Because he came to identify with people who were nobodies before God because of their sinfulness. Sin makes people, people like us, undesirable to God. Sin makes people like us, objects of God's wrath and disgust. Sin makes people worthless to God. Sin makes people, once created in God's image, nobodies in life and losers to evil and death. Jesus was of Nazareth to identify with those who were lost to sin, those he came to save. To put it in biblical words, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus the Nazarene became what God hates, so that he could take what God hates away from us. Does that make sense? Jesus became sin 
so that He could take sin away from us. Jesus became our sin to make us the children of God. He had to be rejected. He had to be the suffering servant in order to achieve the salvation that God promised to His people. By being Jesus the Nazarene, Jesus identifies with the people that He came to save. Jesus is the new Israel of God. Jesus is the head of God's new and true kingdom community. That community is the church of believers who are saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul so eloquently put in Ephesians chapter 2. But sadly, Jesus of Nazareth, he was despised, rejected, and executed by the ones he came to save. Herod had tried to kill baby Jesus, but he failed. But where Herod failed to kill the Christ, the so-called people of God succeeded. Thinking that they'd get rid of Jesus once and for all, the Jews convinced Pilate to execute Jesus. Here at the start of his gospel, Matthew is pointing ahead to the humiliation and the death of Jesus Christ. It was sad, yes, but it was all part of God's sovereign plan, His sovereign plan of salvation. The opening three verses of Isaiah 53 describe in graphic detail the Messiah who would be the branch, the Nezer. That Nezer branch was chopped down. He was hacked to pieces. The next three verses in Isaiah 53 speak of this and they tell us why. Surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. We are the lost and wandering magi-like sheep who go astray. At times, we are the rebellious Herods who turn to our own way, rejecting God and Christ. And yet Jesus came to seek and to save us. To save lost sinners, Jesus had to be crucified. He had to die. Matthew chapters 1 and 2, they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ before we even get to the proper gospel of Jesus Christ, which we say is the Passion Week. Matthew wants to make sure that his readers make no mistake who Jesus is. Sadly, some people, they never get past the birth story of Jesus. They are stuck in a Christmas fantasy, so to speak, about who Jesus is. But as Matthew has taught us in great detail and with biblical proof, Even in his birth, even in his early years, Jesus is revealed as the Messiah Christ, the God who saves, the God who is with us. God created humans to reflect him and to be his image bearers. But because of our sin, we fail to be what God created us to be. And so Jesus Christ came to be God's perfect representative. Jesus Christ is the perfect representation, the perfect image of God because He is God in human flesh. Jesus humbled Himself. He was despised and He was rejected and He did that to save what was lost. We need to keep hearing that. We need to hear that so that it breaks open our stony heart. For we need to receive that humble gift of sacrifice that Jesus offers. And to do that, to receive his humble gift of sacrifice, we need to humble ourselves. We must surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through humble repentance and surrender to Jesus Christ can we ever become the images that God created us to be. We need to despise our prideful selves. We need to hate and get rid of our notions of self goodness if we are to become like Jesus. When we look in the mirror, do we see the reflection of Jesus Christ? When people look at us, do they see Jesus reflected back to them? If not, 
then we aren't becoming like Jesus. And if we're not becoming like Jesus, we likely have not surrendered to him as Lord and King. There are things in our lives that we're holding tightly to and keeping Jesus away from, keeping him out. The truth of the Bible tells us that one day every knee will bow to Jesus Christ the King. Matthew has clearly and unmistakably identified Jesus as that King. Is Jesus your King? Are you serving Jesus? Or are you serving yourself? Do you, do I, belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Or do we belong to the kingdoms of this world and its prince who is Satan? Tough questions to hear and ask ourselves, but we must. We need to know who we belong to. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Nazarene. Despised and rejected by man so that we would not be despised and rejected by God. God gives us faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those who have faith in Jesus, He is calling us to put on His name. We do that as we call ourselves Christians. Christians. Christians wear the name of Jesus. And more and more, with each passing year, the name Christian is a source of scorn and derision, even here in Canada. Will we wear the name of Jesus Christ boldly? And unashamedly? Or will we hide our faith in Christ to remain liked, to remain or to avoid suffering and persecution for all from all those who hate the Lord Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Signing on to Team Jesus, it will not make life easy. It will not provide advantages in this world that hates the Lord Jesus. Promoting the truth of God about Christ and about Christian living. It will make us enemies of society, even within the greater church, promoting biblical morality, particularly biblical sexuality. It makes us enemies. We need to acknowledge that and accept that when we sign on to Team Jesus. But when we do, when we sign on and surrender to King Jesus, we receive something much greater than anything this world could afford or provide we receive eternal life. Deciding to sell out to Jesus, it will earn great rewards in heaven, rewards that we will never exhaust. So let me encourage you, all of us, to join Jesus, who was despised and rejected. Let us take whatever scorn and ridicule and rejection that Satan and this world will send us, and let's take that with joy. Why joy? Because we know that we are suffering for Jesus' sake and for His glory. We know that Jesus Christ was indeed victorious for living the humble life of sacrifice. We can suffer with joy in our hearts because we know that eternity awaits us. And so let let us join with and stick with Jesus and know that we will win. We will be winners for all eternity. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth, for being Jesus the Nazarene and all that represents. We thank you for taking the scorn and the abuse, the mockery, the harsh treatment, and the death that we all deserve. We thank you for taking that on in our place in order to get rid of the sin which separates us from God. We thank you for your life of humble service, for your humility that led you to the cross, for the victory that you won there. We thank you for triumphing over sin and evil and death, and you have done that on our behalf. May our faith in you be evident in how we live. May that faith grow stronger every day. May we boldly go forth letting the world see that we belong to Jesus, that we reflect Him in His light and His love. May we go forth knowing that the world will push back, it will try to harm us, sideline us, erase us, cancel us, because we belong to Christ, because we promote biblical teaching, 
and biblical morality. We go, for, <clears throat> we go forth with that truth because you tell us, Lord Jesus, that all your followers will be treated like you were treated. <clears throat> but we can do that. We can go forth knowing that we will be treated poorly. We can do that in joy and assurance that we are safe in your hands, that we belong to you, that eternity awaits, that all your victories, all your rewards, all your inheritance belongs to us as the children of God whom you have saved through your shed blood. May this wonderful gospel story never fail to impress us, never fail to put us on our knees in humble adoration of who you are and how you, Lord Jesus, have achieved salvation. Our prayers are made in your name, Jesus the Nazarene. Amen. <clears throat> moment as our song of response, we're going to sing that song, Jesus the Nazarene, or I Stand Amazed, as it's also called. We will stand when the music plays and we'll sing. For God in time of congregational prayer. Let's pray. Eternal God, a thousand years in your sight are but as a day that is past. Each and every day and year passes as quickly as one night's watch. We enter a new year, the first Sunday of the year. But whatever the significance of this new year, yesterday morning, is in a sense the same as the dawning of every day since you first created life and light and proclaimed it all very good. 
Lord, we acknowledge Your Lordship over the world that You have made. Your Lordship and Your kingship over the creatures that You have placed in Your creation. We acknowledge Your Lordship over us, feeble and weak creatures, who at times vainly, vainly strive to be masters of our own universe. The universe that You have made, the lives You have given us, over which You are ruler. As we move into this new year, we affirm with confidence your Lordship in the future. Lord, you hold all our days. You know each and every one of us, inside and out. We don't know if we'll have tomorrow. And so, I pray, give us all faith, a strong faith in Jesus today. Based on our conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord, may we live for him in all that we do. We are sure of nothing as we face the future, except that you remain Lord of the world, that you are ever faithful to your people, that you are eternal, you are undefeatable, that you, Lord Jesus, are the King over all creation, the eternal King. You have filled us with the light of your word. We thank you for that. You have made Jesus Christ the word, in, you have made him flesh to be our Savior. We thank you and praise you again for that wonderful truth. We pray that the light of faith, the light of Christ, would shine in all we do. That the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, yet who was born among us and lived with us, that he may be our constant source of inspiration and hope and joy. That our thoughts, the thoughts of our minds, the passions of our hearts, the actions of our lives would reflect him faithfully. And as you have led us in the days that have passed, continue to lead us in the days that lie ahead. Help us to face this future, the future with confidence, knowing that you love us, that you walk alongside us, that you, Lord Jesus, have experienced everything we face, and you did so without sin on our behalf. We pray for those, Lord, who are experiencing joys today, a birthday or anniversary, the anticipation of a child being born, of marriage, upcoming. Thank you for these wonderful markers in life, these wonderful occasions, Lord, that, reflect, or that revolve around life that you've given us, Lord. May we never take any of these events, these relationships for granted. We also pray for those who are going through times of sorrow and stress. I think of Clara, who's being treated for lymphoma. Thank you, Lord, that the treatments are helping her, improving her, quality of life and her ability to enjoy life. We pray that those treatments may be completely successful. We pray for Tom as he continues to recover from his stroke. We thank you, Lord, that he's making slow improvements, but he sees improvements day by day, and we thank you for that. We ask that you be near Georgina as she continues to recover from knee surgery. We pray for Wanda as she recovers from surgery on her brain, Lord, to remove it tumor. There's many others in our midst, in our family, Lord, families who are struggling with health concerns, be near them. Give them your peace. Give them your assurance that you are with them. Be near us, Lord, in whatever this year will bring us. Be with us so that we walk in step with you. We look at the world around us and we see that it is a world that is not in step with you. It's not in sync with how you created this world to be, and that's because of sin. We see the effects of sin in world conflicts, wars, battles between human beings, trying to kill one another. It's not meant to be this way. We pray for those who are potentially going to lose their life, Lord, because of these uh, conflicts. We pray for those who, families of those who have lost life. We pray for the innocent people, Lord, who are caught up in these wars, which have a much deeper root. Of course, the deepest root is Satan, who wants to destroy what you have made, and he does that by turning one person against another, one nation against another. But we pray for the innocent people who are caught up in that. We think of the people in the Middle East, especially the Christians there. We think of those in Ukraine, Lord, and many other places in the world where there is strife and unrest. We pray, Lord, that 
the good news of Jesus may reach those places of conflict and turmoil. That His light, the light that He is, and the light of the Gospel may shine into those dark places. Lord, as we go forth, remind us that You are Lord Almighty, that Jesus Christ is King over creation, and You reign supreme. You are sovereign over all things. May we never doubt or fear what lies ahead of our hope, our trust, our faith is in Christ. For we remain His for all eternity. And we pray this in His name. Amen. In a moment, the deacons will come around and with the collection plates, they'll gather an offering for the Bible League, which seeks to put God's Word into the hands of people throughout the world. And during that offering, we are going to remain seated. We're going to sing a new song, The Lord Almighty Reigns. Feel free to just listen. If you feel like you have picked up the tomb, please join us. We'll remain seated as we sing.
invite you to stand. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for many blessings you have given us. We are also grateful for the organization like the Bible League, who provides scriptures and training people worldwide to bring those hearts to have been prepared for this Holy Spirit in relationship with God as and, and his church. Move these funds as they are used to continue this ministry. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> I'll invite you to stay for some time of fellowship after the service. Receive God's parting benediction before we sing our closing song. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. We sing, the Lord is my salvation. And when I reach the final 